Well, hello, class. Hello, Brother Chris Reynos, and hello, Dr. Brickle. I hope and pray that everyone is staying safe and healthy through this pandemic. So for my presentation, I am going to uh, present the methodology of historical criticism. So let me speak a little bit about historical criticism. If we are to achieve a deeper and thorough meaning of scripture, historical criticism or the historical critical method of interpretation must be utilized in our interpretation of scripture. The historical critical method says that the writers of the Bible were inspired in their writings and in fact what they recorded and wrote is the Word of God. So by historical criticism uh, is meant the study of any narrative which purports to convey historical information in order to determine what actually happened and is described or alluded to in the passage in question. This quote is taken from Howard I. Marshall in his essay, Historical Criticism, from page 126 in New Testament Interpretation, Essays on Principles and Methods. So in my words, historical criticism is the study and understanding of biblical text by analyzing the historical and social context in which they were developed and to understand the text's meaning in its original context. Another quote from Suzanne Schultz defines historical criticism as and again, I quote from uh, Suzanne Schultz, historical criticism allows interpreters to position biblical literature in a distant past, far removed from today's politics, economics, or religion. Although the exclusion of contemporary questions is not an essential requirement of historical methodology, especially not as understood by many historians during the last decades, biblical scholars, often continue using historical criticism in a way that keeps the Bible separate from today's world. This quote is taken from Suzanne Schultz's essay, Tandori, Reindeer, and the Limitations of Historical Criticism, from pages 47 to 69 in her Master's Tools, Feminist and Post-Colonial Engagements of Historical Critical Discourse. So then, what are the goals when we apply historical criticism to a passage in scripture? Let us take a look at a few. The main objective of historical criticism is to find out what did the author intend for this text to mean to its original audience in his or her time and place. So this is what the exegete needs to research. Number one, who wrote it? Here we see Paul and John actually writing their Gospels or Epistle. When was it written? What else was taking place at the time of his writing? Was it at a time of persecution? Maybe was it, you know, what was the culture at the time of the writing? What was going on any time, you know, what during, during the time of the writing and so forth? How did it come to be in the form that we have it today? Was the text redacted over time? Was text taken out of the original? Was text added in to the original? Was text changed uh, in any manner? Did the authors use other sources in their writings, such as other gospel writers, or even maybe going to the Q source? What did it mean to the people who first read or heard it? Would the message have different meaning to someone in the first century than someone reading it today? Would the message have a different meaning to an Eastern audience compared to a Western audience? So let's take a look at what tools an historical exegete would use while conducting his or her study. Well, first of all, definitely they would have to go into literary criticism, textual criticism, source criticism, Form criticism, redaction criticism, 
and reader response criticism. They would also have to look into the history of each um, when these things were written. History plays a big part in historical uh, methodology. A thorough, a thorough study using historical criticism will utilize all of these methodologies. The material I used for the next four slides was taken from Edgar Krentz uh, in the historical method, this book, The Historical Method, from pages 6 to 33. Historical criticism has roots in both the Protestant Reformation and the European Enlightenment. The Protestant Reformation brought back an attention to the literal or plain meaning of the text, aided by new tools for an interest in studying the Bible in its original languages. 19th century German scholars such as W. M. L. DeWitt and Julius Wellhausen tackled the problem of Pentateuch authorship by developing the documentary hypothesis using a source critical method. This work grew to be highly controversial. By adapting historical and literary principles in the study of the Bible, these scholars and others presuppose that the Bible is made up at least in part of human documents whose historical rea uh, reality can be questioned and determined. At the turn of the 20th century, in the face of the perceived threat of historical criticism, some Protestant Christians in the United States recommitted themselves to the fundamentals of the Christian faith, including the inerrancy of the Bible. These Christians, along with many Roman Catholics, rejected historical criticism as a legitimate form of biblical scholarship. Modernist Christians, on the other hand, embraced historical criticism. Protestant theologians from uh, traditions that embraced this new form of biblical scholarship have wrestled with its implication for the authority of Scripture ever since. Here are a few proponents supporting the methodology of historical criticism. Important names in the development of historical criticism include Karl Graf, Hermann Gunkel, Ernest uh, Trollich, Charles A. Briggs, and Rudolf Bultmann. Also, a well-known offshoot of historical criticism was the quest uh, for the historical Jesus. Important scholars in this field included D.F. Strauss, Adolf von Harnock, and William Reed. Sitzenleben. Sitzenleben is a term often heard with historical criticism. In a journal article written by Martin J. Buss, he wrote, and I quote, a term coined in the 19th century by H. Gunkel, defined as the social, the, the social usage in which a genre originates. The concept of Sitzenleben, or Leben, synthesizes two considerations, a concern with genres and a historical focus on originating circumstances. This quote is from Martin J. Buss in his article, The Idea of Sitzenleben, History and Critique. And it, was, and it was, I found this in a German journal, which I cannot pronounce, uh, section 92. And here on the screen, you see our Dr. Brickle lecturing our class on Sitzenleben. And I try to get a good picture of Dr. Brickle. But anyway, let us look at a short case study on the historical accuracy of the one of Jesus' sayings uh, on the forgiveness of sins. We will examine Jesus' healing of the paralytic found in Mark 2, 1 to 12, Matthew 9, 1, 8, Luke 5, 17 and 26. For this presentation, I will analyze the story recorded by Mark, in which Mark records Jesus saying that he has the authority to forgive sins. Here is the scripture from the KG, uh, KJV. Due to time restrictions for this presentation, I will not be able to read the entire passage. But let's take a look at verse 10. Mark writes that Jesus said, and I quote, 
but that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. This is taken from the King James Version. Scholars have argued that this verse was inserted by the early church to promote Jesus' forgiving of sins theme. Those who were opposed to Jesus saying these words claim that they were taken, that they were added to the story. Actually, if not opposed, those that were in favor of this uh, claim that they were added to the story by the early church to promote the authority of Jesus to forgive sins. This is named as the this is named the criterion of dissimilarity. This means that if we can find it in the early church, if they used it, or in early Judaism, then it probably did not come from the source. Norman Perrin writes, and I quote from him, it must be shown to be dissimilar to characteristic emphasis both of ancient Judaism and of the early church. And I took this from Norman Perrin's Rediscovering the Teaching of Jesus. The problem I have with, with, with stuff like this is that these claims are never backed up with any proof. They just claim that this is true, but they don't back it up. So there are two sides to the argument. Rudolf Boltman would agree, would argue, and I quote, there is no other reference in the tradition apart from Luke 7.47 to Jesus who's pronouncing the forgiveness of sins. And that was taken from Rudolf Boltman, The History of the Synoptic Tradition. Now my side will argue this, that Jesus did, in fact, implicitly claim through actions such as miracles and, in this case, the healing of the paralytic, that he did have the authority to forgive sins. Now, there's a proper way and an improper way to argue. Um, the slide on the left is the most sensible way to argue, right? We could do this in a sensible manner, and we don't have to engage in shouting matches with people, demonstrated here by Charlie Brown and Lucy. So the issue I have with those who side with Rudolf Boltman is this, and I quote William B. Alston, and I agree with him. Boltman's claim and others like him is typical, simply asserting that the origin from the early church is manifest without giving any argument at all for the superiority of this hypothesis to live alternatives. That was taken from William P. Alston's essay, Historical Criticism of the Synoptic Gospels, uh, in behind the text history and biblical interpretation from pages 151 to 179 in volume 4 of scripture and hermeneutic series. In other words, where is your proof? I need more evidence than just because all the Gospels don't report exactly the same order of events or the same exact words that Jesus spoke that it did not take place. So, my argument is this, and I will argue that Jesus did, in fact, claim and say through his healings that he had the authority to forgive sins. And here is my defense of my argument. Point one. What Jesus said during these healings episodes were remembered by those who witnessed them. As we have studied in our class, oral communication in ancient times was the main way that people communicated with each other. So what they said by Jesus would have been remembered by the eyewitnesses. Point two, the retelling of these stories were accurately retained and preserved by the early church. What was retained by the eyewitnesses would have been accurately passed down to the church. Point three, the gospels were selective on what the authors wrote. Because of their differences, the four Gospels gives us a fuller and richer picture of Jesus. And point four, if the church was so anxious in promoting Jesus' theme of forgiveness of sins, then why didn't they add this to the other Gospels? Point five, nowhere does Boltman or others like him support their claim with solid evidence that the church added script into the Gospel stories to promote their agenda. So my conclusion is this. New methods of interpretation are being tried and scrutinized every day. Historical criticism 
dating back to the Reformation, <clears throat> even though it has been under attack for centuries, has been able to withstand all analysis. And I will end with a quote from Joseph A. Fitzmaier. Unless the exegete pays attention to all things which pertain to the origin and composition of the Gospels and makes proper use of all laudable achievements of recent research, he will not fulfill his task of probing into what the sacred writers intended and what they really said. Now this quote is taken from an article in the Journal of Theological Studies, volume 50, number two, titled Historical Criticism, Its Role in Biblical Interpretation and Church Life. This was a short presentation on, on, on historical criticism and, how, and why I feel that historical criticism is needed for the interpretation of scripture so that we can understand what the intentions of the early of the writers the original writers wanted us to understand and apply in the bible today and my last slide would be my bibliography this is what i have used i will also post this in on my um, assignment page so that you could go through it and read it thank you and god bless